Greetings, I am Salutations friends, and welcome to the today's Law of Video on the Night Goblins. Now, sadly, the Night Goblins are one of the factions in the Warhammer universe uh, whose awesomeness far outstrips their actual lore. Most of the lore, in fact, pertains to their most famous leader, Skarsnik, but he will be getting a video of his own when he inevitably becomes DLC, assuming, of course, that Azag the Slaughterer is the next orc hero. But back to the point, shall we? The Night Goblins are a, um, I suppose you could say, species of goblins, rather than just another faction of goblins. The reason why you could label them as a species all and of their own is that during the Great Greenskin Migrations in the year uh, 1449 before Sigmar, Imperial Calendar, the graces of Greenskins during their Great Migration wandered pretty much anywhere and everywhere they could fit, and as such many tribes of goblins delved beneath the World Edge Mountains partially to escape their somewhat abusive overlords, the Orcs, by, well, going down cliff faces, going into fissures, wandering down into nice tight caves that the Orcs could not necessarily follow them through. However, though this was a relatively comfortable existence by green-skinned standards with decent enough food, although the food was ever so slightly poisonous, but hey, it's minor details, they can live with it. The Night Goblins decided to stay underground because, well, it was considerably safer than staying above ground and also involved far less hard work. However, over the years, this had its effect on the little goblins, causing their skin to lose the tolerance for direct sunlight. There is the additional problem of their highly evolved night vision which means that when they pop into daylight, their uh, normally fairly keen vision, for goblins anyways, is overwhelmed by the sheer amount of light on the surface world, which, as you might imagine, severely impacts their already somewhat questionable combat expertise. However, though, they are pretty damn good tunnel fighters. In fact, they are one of the better races of tunnel fighters in the Warhammer world, having been able to adopt themselves to their environment in a way that the rest of the Greenskin race really have not quite managed. And it is for this reason pretty much alone that they are one of the dominant factions under Karak Eight Peaks alongside the Skaven and a handful of deluded dwarfs who think they might actually be able to reclaim the fortress. <laughs> Uh, silly bearded little creatures. The only real threat, as ever, is of course the Skaven, as both sides have virtually unlimited numbers, and both sides have invented a wide variety of tunnel fighting weapons. The Skaven clear out tunnels with poison gas, the goblins clear out tunnels with hordes of angry squigs. The Skaven might attempt to break enemy lines with a rattling gun. The Goblins might attempt to break the same lines with a Goblin Fanatic hurling a giant piece of metal around his head. The two races have come to the point where they are both so specialised in their chosen field of warfare that the two races are literally just butchering each other by the thousands on a nearly daily basis. Virtually no other faction in the Warhammer universe could even consider putting up with this rate of attrition, but for the Skavens and the Night Goblins, this is barely above the norm. And I already mentioned squigs, and I already mentioned fanatics, but exactly what are these things? Well, the squigs, as I touched upon in the Greenskin videos, are a wonderful, wonderful little creature. It's kind of a bastardization of a mushroom and a goblin. Imagine if a mushroom and a goblin had sex, or actually, on second hand, for your own sanity, don't imagine that, it's not like the goblins have any genitalia to speak of anyways. They do have an anus, however. Ah, let's not get into that, okay, so. Strike the picture from a mushroom sodomizing a goblin from your head, and let's move on. The squigs, as I said, is essentially a giant ball of rubberized flesh and, well, leather, coupled with the basest of intelligence, and a massive amount of teeth and bad temper. These squigs, as you might imagine, make rather excellent attack dogs. 
The only real problem is that squakes are somewhat dense, which makes them pretty hard to train, as while they are tameable to a certain degree, they have a nasty tendency of simply forgetting about the fact that they've been domesticated. So a squig that one day is all cuddly and lovely and going like, yes, master, I'll numb the evil humans for you, could very easily the next day simply have forgotten the fact that the last time it tried to eat its master, it got hit over the head with a large blunt object. And so, with the consequences of its actions blissfully ignored, it will once again attempt to eat its master. And, well... You're only going to be getting away from the jaws of a squig so many times before the squig gets lucky through sheer dumb perseverance in the most literal of cases. This does not, however, mean that the squigs do not have their uses. A squig does not necessarily have to be tamed to be used effectively in tunnel of warfare. In fact, the only real requisite to using squigs effectively in tunnel warfare is to block off their escape. After all, if the only way forward is through the skaven, or humans, or orcs, or dwarfs, or whatever, well, there's only one way to go then, isn't there? However, the goblins are a remarkably insane species, and have devised another way of utilizing the squigs, namely as mounts. Because if you see a giant bouncing rubberized ball of angry flesh filled entirely with teeth and bad temper that cannot be domesticated because it is too goddamn stupid to learn the lessons you have repeatedly bashed into your heads, naturally your first instinct would be to straddle it. Now, this usually does require a bit of Encouragement on the part of the night goblins, usually in the form of uh, remarkably potent brewery arts. But it cannot be denied that if one can actually ride a squig successfully, and I use ride in the loosest of terms here, then it does make a rather powerful mount. The only problem is that while a normal horse might occasionally try to throw its master off its back for no other reason than because. A squig's very locomotion is essentially an attempt at throwing the rider, seeing as it bounces around virtually uncontrollably. The goblins have found some ways to fasten themselves to the back of their um, chosen mounts, however, usually by hammering pieces of metal into the squig's hides, through which the night goblins can attempt to cling on to the creature's back for dear life, with a more or less decent success rate. However, your up-and-coming Night Goblin Warlord cannot always rely on a, um, shall we say, sufficient supply of liquid courage to um, prod his little soldiers into mounting various squigs and using them as line breakers. In this case, it is far more economical on the local brewery to simply get a single goblin completely and utterly shit-faced, give him a large ball and chain, give him a friendly shove in the general direction of the enemy, and watch him spin happily through the ranks of the enemy. Or, potentially, watch him turn around and spin equally happily through the ranks of his own friends, or, well, at that point, they're probably not that friendly anymore. Regardless, the Goblin Fanatic is a pretty potent line breaker, and it also has a nasty little surprise up its sleeve. You see, in most cases, the Goblin that has been selected for this somewhat dubious honor is carried into battle by his uh, friends. Simply because he's too goddamn knocked to actually walk for himself. Now, this has the unexpected advantage of making it virtually impossible for the enemy to see which units do indeed harbor a fanatic, which can be a rather uncomfortable surprise for the charging unit. It is a night goblin favored tactic to sneak one of these angry little buggers into seemingly harmless units, like, for example, night goblin archers, and then having them charged by heavy and expensive units of Empire Cavalry, for example, only to have this somewhat insane Night Goblin 
spin, spin, spin his happy little ass out of the unit and bludgeoning to death a ton of very, very expensive Empire Knights. The Night Goblins have also taken a liking to a rather unique weapon when it comes to the Warhammer world, nets, or more precisely, weighted nets. Now, a net itself may not seem like all that much of a threatening item in a you know, good old-fashioned brawl. However, a weighted net is very, very much so capable of potentially balling over an opponent, and definitely it's going to entangle him quite badly. And when you're getting swarmed by a bunch of angry night goblins with sharp, pointy objects, getting entangled is probably not a particularly good way of surviving the encounter. However, of course, these nets also have some issues pertaining to the fact that they require a certain amount of skill to operate correctly, which is something the Night Goblins usually have in extremely short supply, which often leads to fellow Night Goblins getting just as entangled as their intended targets, if not more so. There is also the slight problem that uh, should one of the Night Goblins manage to net himself a squig, the problem is that most of these nets are attached to the wielder in some sort. Essentially, they are used as hunting items to catch and drag prey towards them, but a batshit insane jumping and angry squig is more often than not not something your average goblin is going to be able to um, harness effectively. This often leads to the uh, rather amusing sight of a netted squig dragging its helpless captor across the cave network. With all this being said, you might have noticed a somewhat common theme in all of this, namely the fact that a fair few of the Night Goblin's chosen weaponry could, in a bad light, be considered ever so slightly hazardous to the operator, and this would indeed be a very fair assessment of their combat capabilities, but again, there's a lot of Night Goblins, so a few dozens or a few hundred falling prey to um, friendly and, for the most part, unintentional fire is just a hazard that the Night Goblins are more than happy to live with. And while you might originally think that finding volunteers for such volatile weapon systems could be complicated, and you would be right, the Night Goblins have invented a rather ingenious way of um, encouraging people to take up righteous arms in the most lunatic of fashions, namely by getting them absolutely out of their mind shit face drunk on a very, very special, special concoction, namely Fungus Brew. This special and somewhat volatile concoction is usually the speciality of the local night goblin shaman, whose job it is to, uh, well, brew might be a strong word, but create this fungus brew. As to the recipe, well, that varies uh, rather considerably from night goblin shaman to shaman. The only common ingredient seems to be a certain race of green glowing mushrooms which seems to have rather magical effects on the common night goblin, and one would have to assume pretty much any other species stupid enough to have a swig at it. On the other hand, if mere good old-fashioned liquid courage just isn't enough to uh, encourage your hordes to go about their duties in the most fanatical manner possible, then liquid madness will just have to suffice. As for their role in a total war game, well... I would prefer to see the Night Goblins as an army all in and of themselves, led of course by Skarsnik and his great big pet Goblin. They would be a little limited in their unit choices, but not too much, seeing as the Night Goblins come in all variants, with swords and shields, spears, uh, prods, squigs, fanatics, netters, archers, and all manners of stuff and any shortcomings in their roster could easily be made up for with other goblin mercenaries. In addition, of course, to contingents of orcs, as the more um, imaginative night goblin leaders are certainly not above employing their former masters as shock troops. They can usually keep them um, relatively quiescent, with the application of large amounts of fungus brew and the occasional tricking. 
However, currently, it would appear that they are simply just going to be a part of the orcs and goblins army, which um, is not something I am necessarily particularly keen on, particularly considering that one of the leaders of said army is Grimcore Ironhide, an orc that has a rather considerable dislike of night goblins after they attempted to pincushion his ass with sharp pointy sticks fired from bows. Azag the Slaughterer, which is also another potential lord, is slightly more believable, but not by much. The Night Goblins don't particularly like fighting out in the daylight, and neither of these orc leaders are particularly um, subterranean in nature, and uh, neither is the Great Green Jesus. As such, I wouldn't particularly like having them in an orc and goblins army, I do definitely prefer them to have their own thing going, but it looks like we're just going to have to settle with them in the Orc and Goblins army, but at the very least we will get some Night Goblins and perhaps, perhaps, they will be the opportunity to roleplay just a little bit with a Night Goblin Shaman leading a horde of Night Goblins. We can hope, we can hope, and uh, then again, there is always the possibility of Night Goblins being added into the game at a later date as a DLC, which I would be perfectly fine with. Uh, DLC itself is not something I am particularly hostile towards, it's just a cut content DLC I am somewhat um, belligerent towards. Now, that has been it for the Night Goblins lore episode. I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you soon. Have a good day.